Hello everyone, welcome back to Screencast Land. The periodic table in front of you clearly isn't the normal periodic table. I've made some changes to it, and the topic of this video is basically me arguing for those changes. Me explaining to you why I think this periodic table is better than the normal periodic table, or at least why I like it. Now, I've spent a fair amount of time trying to think of an entertaining way to actually present my arguments for the changes that I've made to the periodic table, and after a while I realized that being in grad school leaves me with not very much time, which means the process of making a video that is super entertaining was just not realistic. So instead of having entertainment be my goal for this video, I'm just going to try for clarity. Now the various arguments that I have for the changes that I've made here are relatively numerous, and they're also pretty intricate. So the only quick way I could think of of achieving clarity was to write out my arguments in detail, and then just to have that text up on the screen as I read through it, with the periodic table on the other half of the screen. While that might not be the most charismatic video style, it will at least guarantee a clearly delivered message. So I've got the text that I'm going to read through here on the right half of the screen, and I've shrunk the periodic table that I've modified on the left half of the screen so you can still see the whole thing. So a few months ago, as I often do, I was staring at a periodic table and thinking about two things. The first was the strangeness of period one elements, and the second was the idea that this guy, whose name I don't really know how to pronounce exactly, had in 1926 about neutrons actually being element zero. Although neutrons, I don't think, had been discovered yet exactly, he did come up with the idea of an element that had no electrons and no protons, and therefore essentially posited the idea that the neutron was element zero. These thoughts motivated two changes to the periodic table, which you see to the left. The first change I refer to as the double placement of the minimal first period, where by the minimal first period I just mean hydrogen and helium, and the second I dubbed zero registration. I'll begin with my reasoning for the double placement of the minimal first period. Both hydrogen and helium have valence electrons in the 1s duet. The fact that the first shell is capable of holding only a duet rather than an octet puts hydrogen and helium in a unique position as far as grouping elements goes. My thinking on this began with hydrogen, so that's what I'll start with here. It both has only one electron, but it also only needs one electron to have a closed shell. Electron configuration-wise, this makes it analogous to both of the two most different groups on the periodic table, the alkali metals and the halogens, and its chemistry reflects this. It can form both H plus cations and hydride anions quite easily. Also, intermediate between the two, it can form almost completely nonpolar covalent bonds with carbon. Of course, it is an s-block element, and it follows the electropositivity trend of group 1 rather than the electronegativity trend of the halogens. This is why I would place it in group 1 if I had to put it in only one location. However, it does also follow the boiling point trend and the diatomic nature of the halogens rather than the metallic nature of the group 1 elements. Additionally, it being an s-block element can't be objected to because helium is also an s-block element that is nonetheless placed in group 18 normally. Beyond this, it fits above fluorine in that its hydrohalic acid, which is just diatomic hydrogen, is an even weaker acid than HF, which in turn is a weaker acid than HCl. Of course, below that, they're uh, just strong acids, but HF already starts the trend of moving towards weak acids, and nobody's denying that fluorine is a halogen, so it does technically fit the trend at the very top of the group. Of course, I'm not the first to consider putting hydrogen above fluorine in the halogens. These are just my reasons for doing so. Probably the main difference between me and others is that my idea is to relax the single placement rule and put it in both places rather than having to decide between the two. The fact that there are actually two very natural places for hydrogen led me to start looking for other elements that might have properties justifying multiple placement. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the only other element that I could justify placing in multiple existing groups is helium. Helium has two s electrons forming a complete duet. 
As the IUM ending implies, it was originally expected to be a metal following its discovery by spectroscopy in the sun. However, quantum mechanics produces the duet rule for period one, so it also has a complete shell. This combined with its small atomic radius famously makes helium the most noble of the conventional noble gases, and it definitely does fit the periodic trends of the noble gases very well, much better than hydrogen does for group one. Helium also fits group two less well than hydrogen does the halogens. The double placement argument for helium is therefore fundamentally weaker than that for hydrogen, however I still see it as strong enough. To start with, helium is the lightest two-electron s-block element rather than a p-block element. Additionally, the alkali metals do significantly decrease in reactivity as one travels up the group. Also, the chemistry of elements towards the top of groups changes progressively faster when compared to the rate of change at the bottom. This is a common trend across the periodic table. Helium therefore reasonably well fits the group to inertness trend. In fact, it does so in a similar way as hydrogen in group one, where hydrogen represents a significant decrease in reactivity from lithium. Helium being a non-metallic gas rather than a solid metal also doesn't justify its exclusion, seeing as hydrogen again represents the same situation in group one. Beyond this, one observes a significant drop-off in electropositivity slash reactivity when moving from an alkali metal to its neighboring alkaline earth metal. This is especially pronounced at the top of these groups, i.e. when going from lithium to beryllium and from sodium to magnesium. At least as far as reactivity goes, we also see this trend continue nicely with hydrogen and helium. Further, by providing group 2's analog of hydrogen, meaning a significantly less reactive s-block gas at the top of the group, immediately above the lightest metal in that group, helium can be seen as making group 2 more complete because it then fully matches the structure of group 1. Placing helium at the top of group 2, in addition to its usual place in the noble gases, also avoids a sort of incomplete s-block where it's missing its upper right corner. After sorting out this period one double placement matter in my head, I began to wonder if there were any other changes to the periodic table that I might be able to argue for. At this point, I started thinking about this guy's 1926 attempt to add the neutron to the periodic table as element number zero. I'm not going to review his thinking here, I'll just explain why I like the idea. My reason is pretty simple, limiting ourselves to only the three ingredients allowed on the periodic table, electrons, neutrons, and protons, and the neutrality requirement, equal numbers of electrons and protons, the neutron isn't just a valid element, it's also the only perfectly valid zero value limit of the atomic number parameter. It seems like one must include it for completeness. My thoughts didn't stop here, however. This idea of adding an element zero sparked broader ideas in my head about extending all of the periodic table parameters to zero. While the neutron gives a natural answer to the question of what zero atomic number means, I wanted to see if there was a reasonable way to answer the questions what is group zero and what is period zero. I dubbed this process of extending the periodic table parameters universally to value zero, zero registration. As you see to the left, I did find what I consider to be reasonable answers to these two questions, and the neutron is important for both. Because I came up with this by first thinking about the neutron, I will first argue my choices for group and period zero, assuming the neutron has already been recognized as the valid element number zero. The next step is to decide where on the periodic table the neutron should be placed. I think most people would naturally place it to the left of hydrogen because it has one fewer valence electrons as a first guess. This is how I did it, however I will address the idea of starting with it in the only other logical place later on. This then immediately implies the existence of a group zero with its lightest element being the neutron. Somewhat less obviously, it also hints at the composition of the rest of group zero as well. Given that we placed the neutron at the top of group zero because it had one less valence electron then hydrogen, all of the lower group zero elements must therefore be findable by removing a proton-electron pair from the corresponding alkali metal. This naturally just produces the noble gases, but one period downshifted. So the noble gases validly belong to both group 18 and group zero. Side note, I still wouldn't consider them true s-block elements because they have zero valence s-electrons. 
Now, there are other reasons why I think this makes sense as a group zero and for why I think it is unjustified to take this any farther by, say, making the halogens also group negative one and so on. However, before I get to that, I need to motivate period zero. Since we have just placed the neutron above helium at the top of the noble gases to construct group zero, for consistency's sake we must place it at the top of group 18 as well. Of course, this gives us a natural period zero consisting of just the neutron, which you can see on the table to the left. This leaves us with a complete set of answers to our zero registration questions, but as I mentioned previously, there are other reasons why doing this makes sense, at least to me, and also I need to cover my answers to the two arguments against this zero registration scheme that I thought of. First, I will cover every other reason why I think this zero registration scheme makes sense beyond how I just motivated it, then I'll move on to addressing those two counter-arguments. The first of my additional justifications for part of this zero registration scheme is that the neutron fits the noble gas inertness trend. Of course, the noble gases get less reactive as one goes up the group, with helium being the least reactive traditional element. The neutron has no electrons at all and is therefore completely inert to all electronic interactions except for small ones involving magnetic moment, making it even less reactive than helium. The second additional justification I have, at least for including the neutron as element zero, is a nuclear physical trend. Neutron-rich isotopes often beta minus decay to the next atomic number to the right, and a free neutron beta minus decays to protium with a half-life of about 10 minutes, fitting this trend. The final additional justification I have for particularly the group part of zero registration regards electronic pattern completeness. The following might be a weaker way to justify it, but I still find it compelling. It's simply the observation that the existence of a group 1 with one valence electron essentially implies a group zero with zero valence electrons, a natural reinterpretation of the noble gases, a zero valence count being the lowest valence count relevant to most treatments of chemistry. Further, this leads to a completeness question that's cleanly answered by the neutron, i.e. what is the zero valence electron partner of hydrogen? The only logical answer is the neutron, which, as stated above, also fits the chemical inertness trends of the noble gases which I've placed below them in group zero. This, however, then requires the neutron to also be added to the top of group 18, which gives a natural answer to the question of what period zero should consist of, as noted earlier. Now if we zoom out a little bit and we combine all of our considerations so far together, we see that whether we start by adding a neutron to the periodic table or we start by reinterpreting the one period downshifted noble gases as group zero, we are naturally led to conclude whichever parts we didn't start with. They really do complete each other. Now to address those two counter arguments that I mentioned earlier. I mentioned the first one previously, if the noble gases get to be reintroduced as period zero, why don't we get to also reinterpret the halogens as group negative one and the calcogens as negative two and so on? Remember that the neutron means that there is a valid element zero and as I covered in the first part of the zero registration discussion, this can be seen as motivating the rest of zero registration, i.e. it would be conceptually needlessly unsimple to only partly zero register the periodic table when there is a logical way to complete the task. And also the rest of zero registration gives the neutron important periodic context that isn't clearly communicable in any other way. It highlights that the neutron isn't a structural outlier that fits into no group, and even goes farther to highlight the fact that the neutron does actually fit the periodic chemical inertness trend of the noble gases. And now we get to the really important part. While zero registration helps us understand element zero, there is no element negative one. Negative one registration is therefore not called for. We don't need negative one registration to help us understand how element negative one works in the periodic table because there is no element negative one to add. Note that if you wanted to call anti-hydrogen element negative one, then you'd have to explain what to do with the definitely distinct anti-neutron, despite the fact that negative zero equals zero. 
Another way of saying all of this is that the neutron makes zero registration not purely redundant. It's also the case that there is no clear answer to the question of what period negative 1 would consist of, or what period negative 2 would consist of, and so on, while there is a clear answer to the question of what period 0 should include. So really, zero registration is the lowest registration that you can actually complete. The final reason why zero registration and nothing more is justified is, as I mentioned briefly above, Above. Zero valence is a common and useful concept in chemistry, but there is no use for defining negative valence, at least in this sense. With all of that covered, let's move on to the other counterargument. One additional question that my conception of group zero suggests is, why not just stick the neutron at the top of group 18? Why have a group zero? The first part of my response to this is my existing argument directly for the value of a group zero. The part about zero valence electrons also being a valid way to view the noble gases, but there being no justification for negative valence numbers in chemistry. The second justification for it is that with no electrons at all, the truest zero valence count, the neutron probably fits better in group zero than in group 18, so it really does force you to introduce a group zero. Of course, there is a valid argument for both, so the net result is that we have a situation similar to hydrogen and helium double placement, which is of course why I have it in both places, but the fact that its real home, I think, is in group zero means that you at least have to have group zero for that reason, even if you do also put it in group 18. Beyond this, putting the neutron in group 18 doesn't just zero register the atomic number, but also the period count. Also zero registering the group number count, especially when there is an otherwise compelling way to do this, therefore yields greater conceptual uniformness, simplicity, and consistency at no cost. Now before I finish here, there is one remaining matter that I want to cover. It isn't really a response to an anticipated objection, but instead my response to an anticipated FAQ, specifically about double placement in a periodic table that has already been zero registered. The question is this, given the way I have double placed hydrogen and helium, wouldn't it be proper to place the neutron as the lightest calcogen in addition to its existing locations? Clearly my answer is no, given that I haven't put the neutron over here. My reason is as follows. If if you place period 1 elements by how many electrons are missing from a closed shell, one does end up with the neutron at the top of group 16, however there is absolutely no chemical similarity at all. With the double placement of hydrogen and helium, and the inclusion of the neutron as a noble gas, there is some real chemical justification, however this just isn't true at all for placing the neutron at the top of the calcogens, so doing that is a bridge too far for me. And with that, I have given all the justifications I have for these changes to the periodic table. These are just my reasons for liking it. There's no need to get too angry if you don't like them, but do make sure to tell me what your thoughts are in the comments. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.